Good afternoon, good evening, and very early good morning. <laughs> really depends on who you are. And I'm Jun Yang, the director of uh, the Institute for Corporate Governance. We call that Kelly ICG. So Kelly ICG has been here for a while, and starting in 2021, we've launched a series of public lectures on corporate governance related issues. And we cover the traditional governance topics. We also ventured into the new debates related to corporate governance, sustainability, uh, data technology, and so on. So here I want to thank our co-host, our co-organizer, uh, the European Corporate Governance Institute, the ECGI, and IU's Austrian Workshop uh, that collaborate with us on all these uh, public lectures. So there are several blocks. The top left in black ink is the traditional one, board of directors, CEO Marcus, executive compensation. And then we have something in between, which is so-called CEO activism. How does CEO voice affect uh, the perception of investors and uh, firm performance and so on? And then we have the shareholder side, hedge fund activism and indexer activism. Actually, they're engaged in corporate governance and shareholder voting. And then we move further into uh, the inside of corporate corporations, that's insider trading, white collar crimes, and corporate culture. Uh, on the right, on the top, there's a big block in green. These are topics related to ESG, sustainability, and climate risk. We started with ESG, do we need it and does it work? That was back in November 2021. That's our inaugural public lecture. And we talk about climate risk, sustainability, greenwashing. That was last December's lecture. ESG investing at a crossroads. After we have conducted research on ESG for the past 10 plus years, this is a time we want to look back and see where we are in this debate. For today, we have a well-established scholar. I cannot find no one better uh, to give this talk, ESG with us system level investing. And the last two categories are uh, governance of certification agents, that's rating agencies, including uh, ESG readers. That was our last talk. And the very bottom block on the right is uh, our, our, it's about the new topics, data technology, cybersecurity, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and so on. Next slide. So today we have a new co-host just for this lecture. This is a new research institute at Cali School of Business, that's Institute for Environmental and Societal Sustainability. So they do three sets of uh, outreach, including research, education, and uh, outreach to corporate as well as, uh, as students. So uh, please uh, follow the institute if you're interested in environmental and societal related issues. So this is our advertisement for the next public lecture. We're skipping April. And in May, we have Kelly Shu from Yale University. She's gonna cover incentives and promotions. So there are gonna be many aspects included in the discussion. So please take out your devices. I'm gonna stay here maybe for 15 seconds. Uh, here's the QR code. So now I'm going to introduce today's moderator. So today's moderator is Professor Matt Josephy. He's my colleague from the Department of Management and Entrepreneurship at Indiana University. Matt is CPA as well as CFA, and he does research um, in many various topics related to uh, corporate governance, for example, uh, uh, like the firm survival, leadership team, and he is using some advanced technologies that make me feel like I need to learn more like natural language processing and so on. Uh, Matt has published research in various top, we call the prestigious journals in management, such as Academy of Management Annals and Journal of Business and Venturing and so on. So Matt uh, is a rising star in the Cali School of Business. Without further ado, I'm going to pass the podium to Matt to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Caroline Flammer. Matt. Thank you, June. 
It is my pleasure to host Caroline Flammer for today's talk. Uh, she is currently the A. Barton Hepburn Professor of Economics at Columbia University with joint appointments at the School of International and Public Affairs and the Climate School and a secondary appointment at Columbia Business School. She received her doctoral degree from the University of St. Gallen and has served on faculty at Western University and Boston University. She is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research member at the European Govern Corporate Governance Institute, ECGI. Uh, her research uh, continues to be published regularly, almost every single issue in a number of our top journals, uh, Strategic Management Journal, of course, being the one that I focus on the most, but also uh, across finance journals and other top management journals, uh, like Journal of Financial Economics, uh, most recently. In addition uh, to this scholarship uh, in our top journals, uh, she is widely considered an expert in sustainable investing. And, and has received a number of prestigious awards for her research, including from the Geneva Summit for Sustainable Finance, the Global Research Alliance for Sustainable Finance and Investment, and the Greening Finance Prize. Uh, her impact has been uh, continuing to rise, and she's been named as among the most highly cited researchers in our fields. She describes in her own words, her research is examining whether and how sustainable finance and impact investing can help finance a more sustainable world. She studies how and under what conditions firms can incorporate uh, environmental, social, and governance considerations into their activities to enhance their competitiveness. Uh, her impact extends beyond academia into uh, popular, uh, the popular finance press, uh, has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Time Magazine, and so on. Uh, so without any further ado, it is our great pleasure to host one of the leading voices on these topics, uh, which are of great timely relevance, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts today, Caroline, on your latest work. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the kind invitation and introduction. And let me share my screen here. All right. All right, so today's session, I'll talk about ESG versus system level investing and the need to move towards a systems focused approach. Now, let me get started with the real economy perspective, okay? So I think it's always important to understand what's actually going on in the real economy and then afterwards look at the financial sector. So from a big picture uh, question, the, the, the key question is, do companies' social and environmental responsible practices improve the company's competitiveness? And the short answer to this question seems to be, yes, they can. Not always, of course not always, nothing is always, but you know, on average, correct? So specifically, you can see this along several dimensions. For example, companies' social and environmental responsible practices can foster innovation and prevent knowledge leakage. It can enhance employee governance. It can help companies attract, motivate, and retain talented employees. And it can help companies differentiate themselves from their competitors on the product market, as well as on the market for government procurement contracts. And so perhaps as a result, it's not surprising that companies' social and environmental responsible practices help them sustain their competitiveness during times of economic crisis. Now, in this study, we looked at financial crisis, but there is more recent work on, for example, the COVID crisis, and they, they find fairly similar results in the sense of those companies that engage in more sustainable practices, they, they are more resilient and more successful coming out of the crisis. And so as a result, it's probably not surprising that um, companies' social and environmental responsible practices positively affects shareholders' perception and shareholders' returns. So the bottom line is that companies' E and S practices can be beneficial to companies. Again, not always, but they can. And so as such, you would expect that CSR should be an integral part of company strategy and corporate governance. Yet, you know it as well as I do, that this is often not considered to be the case, okay? The environment and social practices of companies are often not considered to be an integral part of corporate governance and strategy. And this begs the question of why not? Now, one potential reason is that there's a lack of good corporate governance practices in place such as a lack of long-term orientation and a lack of private incentives for managers to actually care about these environmental and social issues. And I'm gonna talk about these two studies uh, in a little while, okay? So in these stu studies, just to give you a, a broad sense, we find that well-designed governance structures that either link executive compensation to long-term financial performance, 
or to environment and social performance criteria can improve the not only the company's sustainable business practices, but also their firm value. So overall, the insights of this research suggest that the E and S of E, S, and G is not separate from governance, but rather an integral part of governance. Now, before I move on, let me take a step back and discuss kind of recent developments that managers face or companies face more generally. Okay, so on one hand, companies are increasingly faced with risks and costs associated with climate change. Uh, this is reflected in, for example, an increase in energy demand, damage of coastal property and infrastructure. There's a decrease in public health, water supply, agricultural production, you name it. In addition, increasingly governments do take actions to curb climate change and other system level challenges. And a prime example is probably the 2015 Paris Agreement in which 195 nations agreed to limit global warming to be two degrees Celsius. And in fact, there's uh, research that suggests that even the threat of stricter environmental regulation can induce firms to reduce emissions and send a strong signal to their investors or the investors of carbon intensive companies. In addition to these increasing physical climate risks and as well as increasing government regulation, companies also face increasing pressure from social activist groups to address societal and environmental challenges. And this pressure has intensified with the use of social media. And Oops. And lastly, and perhaps as a, you know, uh, as a reflection of these different trends, shareholders, so the company's very own shareholders, increasingly show interest and exert pressure on their portfolio companies, demanding not only the adoption of a longer term orientation, but also improvements in the portfolio companies environment social responsible practices, and to disclose the, the portfolio companies' exposure to climate change risks. You can also see this increasing interest and uh, um, the pressure from among the shareholders in the increasing number of signatories of the UNPRI, which is the largest network of responsible investors. Now, let me delve a little bit more into these, uh, not necessarily the studies that themselves, but rather to show you that trend of increasing interest among um, investors about the environmental and social performance of their portfolio companies. And so here I'm going to one of my studies here. I'm, again, I'm not really discussing the paper per se, but rather I want you to, to see kind of this increasing trend of shareholder activism related to environmental and social issues. So here we are looking at shareholder proposals that were submitted to the annual meetings um, by the investors um, on topics such as environmental issues, the development of a sustainability report, the addition of minorities and women to the board, animal rights, human rights, labor issues, political issues, etc. What you can see here is the summary statistics by year. So it is a little data that study. Okay, so uh, the data is from 1997 to 2012. What I want you to take away uh, from this is that there is an increasing number of shareholder proposals related to environmental and social issues over the years. What you can also see that the approval rate, the percentage of approved proposal, as well as the average vote outcome has increased over the years. Now, of course, it's still miserable, let's face it. Okay, it's still very, very low, but it, it has gained more and more support by other investors. Okay, now you might wonder what are these proposals about? Back in those days, at least, most of these uh, proposals were related to environmental issues and labor issues. Nowadays, I would expect that there, you would also see an increasing number of proposals related to the addition of minorities and women to the board, as well as sustainability reports. Okay. Um, lastly, let me share with you who these investors are who submit these proposals. Now, the, but, uh, by far the most active investors that submit environmental and social responsible uh, related proposals are religious groups, the nuns. But they are also phenomenally unsuccessful in getting other investors to vote in favor of these proposals. Okay, similarly active, but more successful in getting other investors convinced to actually um, uh, vote in favor of these proposals are public pension funds and sustainable responsible investing funds. Now there could be many different reasons why this may be the case. One potential reason is when you look at the framing of how these proposals are framed. The religious groups tend to make a normative case that 
one should do this just because it's the right thing to do, while public pension funds and sustainable responsible investing funds tend to rather try to make a business case or rationalize like reason in a sense of why it would make sense from a business perspective. Okay, but again, there could be other reasons related to that. Also, for example, religious groups tend to be the first ones submitting a proposal, and maybe later on, it's public pension funds and SRA funds that follow up in the following year. Okay, all right, let me move on. So, what I find in this study is that actually those companies that mostly um, uh, accept this proposal show an improvement in their firm value, suggesting that CSR is value enhancing. And it also, of course, depends on how much CSR is already being taken, um, uh, undertaken and what the norm is in the industry. All right. In addition to this increasing interest by the investors on the portfolio companies' environment social uh, engagement, investors are also increasingly concerned about their portfolio companies' exposure to climate change risks. And this leads me to the next study that is joined with Mike Toffel and Kala Viswanathan from Harvard on shareholder activism and firms' voluntary disclosure of climate change risks. Now, what is important to understand is that in most countries around the world, there is unfortunately a lack of mandatory disclosure requirements imposed by the government. Okay. So um, on non-financial information. And so, for example, the, in the US, the SEC merely recommends that companies disclose their climate change risks but does not mandate it, not offer any guidance on how to disclose it. Now, just yesterday, uh, there was a new ruling. So um, this has slightly changed. Uh, we can discuss this later on, if you wish. Um, in a sense of the SEC came out with mandatory climate risk uh, disclosure rules, um, whether or not they really make any big difference, uh, that's to be seen. But um, in any case, in absence of mandatory disclosure requirements, many companies fail to disclose their exposure to climate change risks and non-financial information more generally. Now, why is this the case? Well, one potential reason is that um, because there's a temporal separation of the potential benefits and downsides related to the voluntary disclosure of such risks. Okay, So on one hand, Disclosing the exposure to climate change risks may be beneficial to the disclosing company as it may help manage and mitigate uh, these climate risks in the long term. So just to give you a couple of examples, the increased transparency may increase the firm's accountability in the public's eye, which helps strengthen the firm's commitment to manage and mitigate these risks moving forward. Also, the increased transparency allows investors, business partners, and others to engage with the disclosing firm more in a more informed fashion, and hereby also offer better advice, for example. And lastly, transparency can foster trust. We know from a large literature that investors, for example, appreciate increased transparency, and, and so this could also help strengthen the firm's relationship with investors as well as other stakeholders. Now, the downside is that these benefits that you know, may occur they are likely only going to occur in the long term. Um, so while they help improve the firm's governance and long-term firm value, they might actually be, again, only um, uh, materializing in the long term, while the costs or the downsides of disclosing climate risk exposure uh, might already kick in the short term. Okay, And so these downsides include, for example, that companies may reveal vulnerabilities that they would prefer to keep secret from their investors and others, for example, related to stranded assets. Also, the disclosing climate risk information may entail direct costs, so obviously, and that, that was one of the big discussion points uh, with the SEC disclosure rules, that actually disclosing these uh, climate risks and costs it's costly for firm, correct? You actually need human capital to, to dedicate the time to it and to, to assess it correctly. And last but not least, uh, it may lead to adverse reactions by exacerbating firms' overall climate risk exposure. So for example, if investors or, or even the buyers of the company's products, if they realize the supply chain gets in, um, um, is exposed to way much worse climate risks than they thought so, and there's a risk of supply chain disruptions, for example, the buyers of the company might, might um, diversify away and buy the, their, their supplies from somebody else. Okay, 
So again, as I mentioned before, unfortunately, downsides likely kick in in the short term, while the upsides of disclosure only materialize in the long term. So as a result, companies may not, or managers may not uh, disclose these climate uh, change risks um, if they are not forced to do so. And this relates back to uh, largely to change psychology and economics, where we know that individuals in general, so not just managers, but individuals in general, are so-called hyperbolic discounters, meaning they have an excessive preference for the present. So we all do basically prefer the short-term rewards over long-term rewards, even if long-term rewards are substantially higher. This myopic behavior can be due to cognitive limitations, instant gratifications, impatience, etc. Now, for executives, this myopic behavior can be further reinforced by, for example, career concerns and analyst pressure to meet or beat analyst expectations, as well as short-term compensation. Okay, so as a result, myopic managers tend to favor short-term investments over long-term investments, even if long-term investments would basically improve firm value. Now, you might wonder what does that have to do with climate risk disclosure? Well, as I mentioned before, the implication of this time-based agency conflict is likely that managers may put more weight on the potential short-term downsides of disclosure versus the potential long-term long -term upsides of managing and mitigating those climate risks. And they may focus their attention on those stakeholders that have short-term financial performance implications for their firm um, uh, versus stakeholders who may very much be material to the firm in the long term, but again, they might be less uh, financial material in the short term. Okay, so all to say, in the absence of public govern governance, in the absence of mandatory disclosure requirements, firms often fail to disclose their exposure to climate change risks and to adapt and to mitigate these risks. And th that this is the case is also supported by some recent research by uh, Shali, who is now an assistant professor at London Business School. Uh, she actually looked at whether companies that are exposed to more physical climate risks are more likely to adapt their firm's strategies. And the unfortunate answer is that, well, yes, they do, but only about 23% of them, okay? And those companies that do it adjust, adapt, we are not talking about mitigation here, we are talking about adaptation to climate change risks. Those companies that adapt to climate change risks tend to do so only in a kind of superficial way, a quick fix, but not fundamentally change their business strategies. So a possible implication of these insights is that we are fundamentally underprepared for the increasing risks and costs of climate change that we are facing. All right, on that positive note, um, let me kind of sum up, correct? So we have different trends going on. On one hand, increasing risk and costs of climate change, um, increasing government regulation, increasing social pressure from social activists that has intensified with the use of social media. We have increasingly investors, the, the company's very own shareholders, who, who show interest but also make pressure on the portfolio companies to improve the environment and social business practices, as well as to disclose their exposure to climate change risks. And so I think overall, it's fair to say that the advocacy in support of a longer term orientation as well as uh, more environmental and social friendly practices has become more powerful over the years, which may have led some of the board of directors to adopt new corporate governance practices, such as the linking of compensation to long-term financial performance as opposed to short-term and the linking of compensation to specific environment social uh, performance criteria. And let me very briefly talk about these studies uh, before I move on. Okay, so in this study that is joined with Tima Banzal from Ivy, we look at whether or not the adoption of longer term compensation um, leads to an improvement in firm value. And we also try to dig deeper into why would that be so. So we also look at whether or not these companies then um, engage in more longer term strategies such as innovation and uh, stakeholder relations. So again, this is just a recap from what I mentioned before. In general, in most countries around the world, there's a, non, a, a lack of mandatory disclosure requirements of non-financial information. And 
again, from a large literature in economics and psychology, we know that individuals in general are myopic. Uh, um, myopic. And this, this myopia is further reinforced and um, worsened basically for managers. Okay, So as a result, companies are likely to face a time-based agency conflict where managers may have an excessive preference for the short term and may not act in the best long-term interest of shareholders. And so, as I mentioned before, what board of directors could be doing to mitigate this agency conflict is to provide longer-term compensation to these managers. And we find that, indeed, providing longer-term compensation helps um, not only improve the sustainable business practice of these companies, but also improve firm value in the long term. Another practice that board of directors could implement is to tie executive compensation to specific environment and social performance criteria. This practice is also often called ESG-linked compensation or, to be more precise, ES-linked compensation. Okay, So, for example, companies may link compensation to specific CO2 emission targets, employee satisfaction targets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, um, um, just to you know, take a step back again. So, how does that really work? I mean, of course, it's kind of tricky to, to tie compensation to environmental social practices. The question is also which practices do you tie it to? How do you measure them, etc.? So, this is much more complicated than tying compensation to long-term financial performance. But just to get a get a get a sense of what might be going on in the kind of psychology of the managers, again, take this my, myopic managers. Okay, so. On one hand, we know that managers tend to be overly concerned about short-term performance, which is even worsened by short-term compensation, short-term reward systems, um, uh, analyst expectation to meet quarterly earnings, career concerns. If you are operating in a country where you can basically be fired at any moment, if you don't meet the financial performance targets, then you might worry more and more about short-term uh, performance criteria. In addition, aside from that, Managers face many, many different pressures from different stakeholders. Okay, we very often assume that stakeholders are all aligned. <laughs> this is not really the case. So you might face, um, as a manager, you might face customers, come up, customers with short-term claims about pricing. They want to have low price, uh, low costs. But on the other hand, you have the environmentalists who make pressure on you about uh, environmental friendly production, etc. And so the question then becomes: Is well. If those stakeholder interests collide, who do you listen to? Whose demands are you actually trying to uh, fulfill if you listen to stakeholders in the first place? Okay. And so, given the kind of the myopic behavior of managers, they are more likely going to listen to those stakeholders whose claims and demands have short term financial performance implications for their operations as opposed to stakeholders that might very much be valuable for the firm in the long term, but don't necessarily have short-term financial performance implications. I'm talking here, for example, about local communities and natural environment. Think about mining companies uh, operating in somewhere in the jungle. Um, and you know, local communities and natural environment don't necessarily have a voice and can't really run into your door and complain. Well, if your employees and customers are unhappy, well, they probably very quickly walk out the, of the door. Okay, so unless managers are incentivized to pay attention to, for example, the local communities and the natural environment, they may just ignore them. All right, and so what we find that indeed companies that adopt these environmental social linked compensation, um, they show not only longer term, uh, improved longer term financial performance, but also improved sustainable business practice with respect to natural environment and local communities in industries where those stakeholders are financially material. Of course, if you link compensation to stakeholders that you would pay attention to already anyway, then there's less of an effect or probably just zero effect. Okay, Again, it's much more tricky to meaningfully implement ESG-linked compensation, um, but it could direct more the managers to specific stakeholders and help improve firm value. So just to wrap up, what we find that is that long linking compensation to either long-term or such and environmental social performance uh, criteria 
can not only improve the firm's sustainable business practices and innovation, but also the long-term operating performance, which is already reflected in an improvement in stock price in the short term. So overall, you might wonder what are the implications for practice? Well, these insights suggest that corporate short-termism, especially in the US, are hampering business success. So absent proper private incentives, executives tend to underinvest in long-term projects, which not only hurts the companies and the investors, but also the envi environment and society. So overall, this also suggests that the E and S of E, S, and G, I know this is an acronym nowadays we are almost not allowed to use anymore, um, but it suggests that the E and S of E, S, and G are not separate, but an integral part of G. All right. Now, with all this in mind, let me switch over to the financial sector, okay? What do we know from the academic, broader academic research about the relationship between ESG or the corporate sustainable uh, environmental performance, financial performance, and risk? Overall, the academic research suggests that there's a positive relationship, positive correlation, I'm not talking about causality here, a positive correlation between ESG and financial performance, and a negative correlation between ESG and risk. This suggests that actually for investors, pursuing an ESG investing strategy to improve the portfolio company's environment social performance criteria can, on average, be beneficial for investors. Again, not always, but on average. Now, you might wonder, so how can investors actually influence their portfolio companies? Okay. Well, there are different ways. On one hand, investors can invest in equity. And there are different, as you know, you can either um, invest more passi pa passively using ESG screening, so negative screening or thematic screening, or just use ESG integration, considering ESG-related factors in your portfolio construction. In none of these two, you engage directly with the portfolio company. You just use this information in order to construct your portfolio. In addition, investors can also more actively engage with their portfolio companies, be it through shareholder engagement, so closed door, behind closed door uh, conversations with top management. This strategy is available for especially large investors, such as public pension funds. And then, the, um, in addition, shareholders can engage in shareholder activism, submitting proxy statements to the annual meeting. These are the ones that I showed you before. Okay, now. When you think about how ESG investing is typically being practiced, and most of our research actually focuses us on these, is passive, okay? So this, by far, this is basically the, the most common way investors engage in ESG investing in equity. Yet, if you think about what is most likely more effective in triggering actual change in the real economy, this is not passive investing, but rather actively engaging with your portfolio companies, okay? So this suggests that on one hand, as researchers, we are focused on the wrong area here, uh, but it also suggests that, um, or maybe we just focus on what is being mo most practiced, but what is important, at least in my view, is that we really try to understand, is there actually a change going on in the real economy? Um, because if you think about it, if you divest, I mean, there's a lot of pressure on investors to divest from fossil fuel industries, for example. But what happens if you divest? Well, if you divest, you clean up your own portfolio. It looks clean, it's green, but you lose the seat at the table. You can no longer influence your portfolio company and therefore it doesn't mean that their portfolio company you just divested from is gonna improve its system business practices. Of course, you can make a very strong assumption that each single investor is going to behave exactly the same way and it drives up the cost of capital, but this is a rather strong assumption. Okay. So um, besides equity, investing in equity, investors can also in, uh, invest in debt. And uh, ever since 2013, um, with the first issuance of a corporate green bond, this market has really exploded. So there has been a downright green bond boom. And so green bonds, just for those of you uh, who may be less familiar with them, are bonds whose proceeds are committed to finance ESG-related projects. 
Now, in one of my studies, I actually looked at whether corporate green bonds really deliver on the promise or are they just a tool for greenwashing? What I find that is on average, these green bonds have uh, um, show subsequently improved environmental performance of the issuing companies, suggesting that it's not just about greenwashing. Yet, when you look at where, where this is coming from, it's only certified green bonds that show, uh, those companies that issue certified green bonds that show an improved uh, environmental performance following the issuance of these green bonds. Other, other issues, they don't show any such improvement. So suggesting that greenwashing is indeed a concern, it's a big concern, um, in absence of public governance. And similar as with the disclosure rules, Basically, here with uh, ESG, um, uh, with green bonds, fixed income instruments, it's again the wild, wild west a little bit, because in most countries around the world, I think except for China and India, if I'm not mistaken, there is no public governance. So in a sense, of, from a legal perspective, a green bond is fairly similar to a vanilla bond. So in other words, a company could just issue a green bond and then decide to invest those proceeds into some other project. Um, and so there's enormous concerns about greenwashing. Okay, so again, these are, these results also suggest that given that the results are stronger for certified green bonds, actually certification by independent third parties, private governance, so to speak, plays an important role in improving the governance of this market. So what are the implications for practice? Well, it suggests that certified corporate green bonds serve as an can serve as an effective financial tool to, to create long-term value for companies and improve the environmental footprint. And as such, they could potentially serve as an important tool uh, against climate change or allow us to transition to a lower carbon economy. Yet again, as I mentioned before, the greenwashing concerns remain, especially for uncertified bonds. Now, um, this current lack of public governance likely is suboptimal. Um, and let me just discuss a couple of these challenges that we are facing. On one hand, the definition of green is still ambiguous. I mean, there has been major progress being made in Europe, for example, um, but still the, the, uh, the ambiguous definition of green complicates certification. Also, there are multiple taxonomies, okay? So this lack of universal rules and standardization may impede the effectiveness, efficiency, and in integrity of the overall market. And at this moment, certification is binary. It's either certified or not. But this provides relatively little information if you think about it. And so probably more informative would be if we had tiered uh, certification scheme similar to the credit ratings that we have. And last but not least, at this moment, at least to my knowledge, none of the certifications require additionality. So the question of whether a project would have been financed anyway or take, undertaken anyway, even in absence of the issuance of a green bond. And so this raises the question of, of whether certification should include this requirement that uh, it's only a green bond, a certified green bond, if it's actually additional and the project would not have been financed otherwise. Okay. So in other words, this um, um, a mix of public and private governance would likely uh, improve the overall governance of this market. And for sure, we need much more research in this space. Okay, all right. Let me move on to kind of additional thoughts here where I think we really need to better understand what's going on. Um, we talk a lot about the transition to carbon neutral economy by 20. 30 or 2050, okay? We know that this requires major investments in the real economy in addition to transitioning uh, the carbon intensive industries. It also raises important social challenges such as job losses, dying industries, geopolitical tensions, et cetera. I mean, if you, if you, for example, close down shop in Louisiana and then invest into green technology in, let's say, California, these are neither the same regions, geographic regions, nor are these the same people you're going to hire. And so, again, this leads to job losses, dying industry, geopolitical tensions, etc. And in order to ensure a just transition, we really need to bring in the human side of things into this whole conversation and into our research. I don't see much research at this moment, including my own, to be fair, 
um, that really brings in the human aspect about how can we ensure a just transition to a low carbon economy that uh, does not worsen social inequalities within countries and across countries. Another question that I think deserves way much more attention moving forward is ever since the development of the green bonds, uh, there has been a proliferation of other types of ESG fixed income instruments, such as transition bonds, climate bonds, SDG bonds, social bonds, sustainability bonds, you name it. Now, on one hand, this is exciting to see, correct? There's an increasing great, uh, in interest in this, but it also raises important questions and concerns. So for example, we haven't even fixed the green bond market, the governance of the green bond market, and now we have this proliferation of other kind of ESG fixed income instruments. And so the question is, on one hand, how different are these ESG fixed income instruments really? Are they just a proliferation of greenwashing? And what is the implications? What are the implications of these uh, ESG fixed income instruments? So do they actually really lead to the mitigation of the grand societal challenges we are facing? Okay. Um, I think there's so much more work to be done, uh, not just academic, in terms of academic research, but also in terms of practice. All right. In the last couple of minutes, let me talk about ESG versus system level investing. Okay, so basically share with you where I think practice and research should be going. Let's take a step back. We're in the midst of multiple crises, climate change, biodiversity loss, social inequality, poverty, etc. Pick your favorite crisis. The typical response by not just academics, but also by society in general is that it's the government's role to regulate and to fix these crises. Yet, whoever has a window and looks out of the window realizes that whatever the governments are doing, it's not sufficient. And this puts the spotlight on the private sector, both the real economy and the financial sector. And the question is, what can they do and to what extent? What are the limitations of the private sector to help mitigate these grand societal challenges. Again, likely the first best solution would be that the governments would be taking actions. But again, whatever they are doing, it's unfortunately not sufficient because otherwise we wouldn't be in the midst of this crisis. All right, so the spotlight is in the private sector. Now, when you look at the current ESG practices, corporate sustainability, ESG, whatever you want to call them, our thinking, frameworks, theories, models, and practices are really confined to the firm level and portfolio level. We don't take into, into account the broader system. So let me just give you a couple of examples of what I mean and what kind of to, to explain a bit what my concern is here. So let's look at the real economy, at the corporations. Uh, scope one, scope two, scope three emissions. There was just a recent SEC disclosure rules yesterday coming out, correct? So scope one emissions are the direct emissions of a company. Scope two are the emissions consumed by the energy that companies consume. And then scope three emissions are the emissions of the, the consumers and the suppliers. Now, again, in most countries around the world, there's no mandatory disclosure requirement. The current way we assess the environmental performance of, of companies tends to be scope one, not scope two and not scope three, just the direct emissions of a company. If we were to mandate, and this suggests that the SEC is going that way, um, that, okay, if we were to mandate the disclosure of scope one emissions, this would be already a major improvement in this world, because at this moment, again, in most countries around the world, it's not mandated. But if we don't include scope two and three, especially three, what's likely going to happen, this is what we already observe happening, is that uh, companies start arresting their most emission intensive operations or they outsource them to some supplier. So scope one becomes scope three. So on file, the way we currently assess the environmental footprint of companies, it looks like they clean up their act. But nothing really changes with respect to climate change because all they do is shift their emissions to somewhere else. Okay, it becomes an accounting game. I can make a similar example with diversity and inclusion, a very, very important and sensitive topic, especially in, uh, in the US for good reasons. The current way we, we ask the questions about diversity and inclusion is, for example, how many women and minorities do you have on the board and how many of them do you have in top management? These are 
For sure, very important questions, but unlikely sufficient. Because what it might just lead to is a reshuffling of talent from one top company to the other top company, or from one top university to the other top university. But it does not mean greater accessibility and greater social mobility. Okay, it might just be a reshuffling of one single person. Let me flip over to the investors, to the financial sector. It, as I mentioned before, there is, for example, a lot of pressure on the divest, on investors to divest from fossil fuel industries. Now, if you really care about addressing climate change, divestment alone may not be the most effective way because all you do, as I mentioned before, is you divest. So that means you clean up your portfolio. This is what I mean by portfolio level thinking. But you may not necessarily change the underlying sustainable business practice of the company you just divested from. Okay, So probably a more effective way would be to stay engaged, to stay invested, and actively engage with the portfolio companies to drive real change. Now, whether or not you, you basically, as a last resort, you divest in case the company doesn't improve its act, and this is a different question. Two more examples before I get to the point. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's some research out there saying, don't worry about climate change, you can just hedge away the risk. Can you? really hedge away climate risks. What you can do is you can hedge the portfolio risk against climate use. But that does not take into account the long-term implications of your investments on climate change, on increasing risk cost of climate change, or by the rules of law, social inequality, etc. Nor does it take into account the increasing risk and cost of climate change and these societal ch challenges on your portfolio's long-term financial performance. The key theory that we use and also use in practice, modern portfolio theory, assumes that systemic risks are exogenous, not endogenous. So we just assume away this interrelationship between our investments and the system level challenges and the fact that these challenges are becoming worse and worse over time. Okay. Oh, I have actually two more examples. Apologies for that one. <laughs> Now, the typical way we, uh, we ask the question is, what are the, given a set of rules and regulations by the government, exogenously imposed by the government, what's the best action for the company and the investors? We hardly ever ask the question, both in research and in practice, how can investors and companies be a change agent and positively engage with government and help trigger systemic change, correct? So just going back to, for example, the way we measure environmental performance, we currently, when we assess the environmental performance of companies, we just look at scope one, the direct emissions. But we hardly ever consider whether or not the company lobbies against or for climate policies, engages in campaign contributions, engages in coalition building with industry partners. Correct. So we just look at one side of, of the coin, like one type of action of a company, but we don't consider the holistic approach of a company when we assess the environmental performance. So you might have, a, have the case that a company has a relatively good environmental footprint, scope one, but then it, its lobby department, which is a different department in a company, and they don't necessarily speak to each other, the sustainability officers and lobby folks, they lobby against climate policy. Or similarly, with the social uh, example, a company might have relatively good diversity, equity, inclusion practice in place for its own employees. So it would score relatively high on the S of ESG. But we ignore whether or not the company lobbies for or against uh, LGBTQ rights at the state level or abortion rights at the state level, etc. Okay, so. We really don't look at the holistic view of what a company does and similarly what investors do. And last but not least, let me talk about blended finance. So as I mentioned before, we, we are in the midst of multiple challenges, correct? Climate change, biodiversity loss, social inequality, poverty, etc. Typically, historically, the way we have been financing to transition to a low carbon economy, the financing of the protection of biodiversity, etc., is through development funding, be it public funding, um, 
um, development finance institutions such as the you know IFC, Asian Development, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and philanthropic funding such as the WWF, Nature Conservancy, etc. But we face an enormous financing gap. Um, and so the key question is, to finance the mitigation of these grand societal challenges, how can we attract more private capital to crowd in so that we can finance innovative solutions in clean tech, renewable energy, nature-based solutions, social innovation, et cetera, especially in the global south? So how can we crowd in more private capital to close the financing gap and effectively address these system level challenges. There is very little research on public-private partnerships, um, in especially with respect to finance. In strategy management, we have way much more. Okay, so critical factors to mitigate system level challenges and achieve a more sustainable world. On one hand, just to summarize what I said before, we need to develop better metrics that really allow us to track progress towards the mitigation of these grand societal challenges. We, we need to move away from just pure portfolio level thinking and firm level thinking and adopt the systems focused approach. And for example, consider whether or not investors uh, not just engage with their own portfolio companies, but also whether or not they engage in coalition building, whether they, they, they engage with the policymakers to change the rules of the game. And we need to create public-private partnerships and gain a way much better understanding of what's going on, how to creatively uh, partner up so that we get the funding together to close the financing gap that we are facing. So to conclude, let me just conclude with some remarks about public funds. So if you think about it, public funds, public pension funds, or wealth funds, they are the ones that are most exposed to the systemic risks, be it climate change, biodiversity loss, social inequality, et cetera. They can't diversify away anymore. They already diversify. At the same time, they are among the biggest investors who own a large part of the global assets. And they have the necessary long-term horizon to provide long-term capital uh, to their portfolio companies. So one could say that public funds have the power and the necessary long-term horizon to trigger effective change in their portfolio companies' ESG practices. Um, and their effectiveness is likely intensified uh, or amplified since many other investors actually follow their lead. Okay, so the, given the insights from academic research, public funds, you can argue, have a unique opportunity here to not only improve their, their own ESG practices, but also to actively engage with their portfolio companies to improve their environment and social practices and the disclosure of uh, systemic risks. They can also invest in certified ESG fixed income instruments to finance a more sustainable world and to actively engage with public policy, be it on risk disclosure, on ESG practices, etc., to affect systemic change. Doing so would likely not only help improve the environment and social uh, performance of these companies, but also um, make our broader system, environmental, social, and economic system, more resilient and decrease systemic risks. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, I can tell you that from the engagement in the Q&A, there's uh, phenomenal interest in all of the topics that you've been covering. Uh, and so I've done my best to synthesize some of the themes of both what's coming live uh, while you've been talking, as well as some of the questions that were submitted in advance. So I want to maximize the time we have left to get, keep you talking on a number of these topics. Uh, so the first question that I'll go to is around something that you insinuated a couple times during your talk about sometimes the pushback to the notion of ESG. Uh, so this is phrased a few different ways from different uh, people who pose the question. Do you believe that interest from the investor community in ESG has peaked? Do investors care about these ESG initiatives and want to see more of them? Is the backlash against ESG warranted? How do you measure if ESG practices are driving better outcomes? So in general, I'd, I'd group this as uh, how would you speak to some of the current skepticism of ESG and even uh, what feels like a little bit of a pullback from some of the prior ESG 
initiatives over the last decade. Um, how how many hours do do I have to answer this question? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so so okay, let me try to tackle it in different ways. On one hand, my sense is I I would be surprised if it has peaked. Um, in a sense, as long as we face increasing risks and costs relate or increasing climate change, in, as long as we don't address these broader societal challenges, I don't see how investors would decrease their interest in understanding what, for example, the risk exposure is of their portfolio companies to these uh, risks, correct? So uh, I would be surprised if that interest really decreases. Now, whether or not they use the term he or she, that's a different question. Mm -hmm. um, so some companies have moved away from using he or she and now talk about transition X, Y, Z. Fine. Um, but I don't think it, it changes the fundamental underlying issue or the fundamental way what they try to address. Um, in a sense of, you know, yeah, there is a backlash. Much of it is politicized. Um, um, to, to some extent, it's exciting to see there's increasing in, uh, interest. I mean, who would have thought five years ago that it would, you know, ESG would be in the headlines of the major newspapers? <laughs> I mean, to some extent, it's, it's exciting to see this increased interest by the broader public, right? Um, and certainly, it has also put more scrutiny on the practice, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, in several ways, there are huge concerns about greenwashing. Mm -hmm. Or there are, in my view, there are concerns about um, the reason I presented first a real economy perspective and then flipped over to the financial sector perspective is I, I think very often practitioners as well as academics, they don't necessarily think about what's really going on in the real economy. And so, for example, I've been moderating several roundtables on ESG fixed income instruments. And very often the panelists say, oh, it's great. It's great. There's increasing increasing interest and in, you know increasing sales of these ESG fixed income instruments, and very often I tell them, guys, I think you're missing the point here. The key question to me is, does it actually trigger change in the real economy, or is it just greenwashing? You, it's great, you make revenue here, but but is this really what you care about, right? And so and so it, again, to some extent in. In absence of public governance, in absence of, for example, mandatory disclosure requirements, it's unlikely that we we come up with. So one one criticism is often bad measures. Mm -hmm. Well, as long as companies don't have to disclose it and don't have to disclose it in a standardized way, it's unlikely we necessarily make progress in this respect. Correct, and so. Um, so this is one aspect. Um, so do we need better metrics, metrics, measurements? Of course. Mm -hmm. Do we need better disclosures? Yes. Would that help improve the effectiveness of XYZ? Yes. Um, do we yet measure impact? Many don't. <laughs> um, correct. So, so I do think that the increased scrutiny is a good thing because hopefully that helps improve the overall practices. Um, but even without the ESG backlash, I do think there's something deeper we should be concerned about. And that is that we really start moving away from just portfolio level thinking mm -hmm. and firm level thinking. I mean, think about, for example, the, uh, all the literature in management. Very often, the question we ask is, what's the financial, perform uh, finance, financial performance implication for the company in the short term? Right? So we don't even consider the long term. We very often just look at operating performance in one year, maybe two years, maybe three years. Don't ask for 10 years. Right? <laughs> so, so we don't even consider questions really or measure them in terms of what's really long term firm value. That's one thing. Um, but I think we should also, we need, we need to, uh, redirect our focus to not only think about what's good for the company, good in a sense of financially, but what are the actual implications for society and the environment? Mm -hmm. Do certain so social and environment responsible practices really trigger change? And this probably leads to, again, the question about additionality, correct? So, um, so yeah, let me, that was a long answer and I'm not sure I made much sense, but. 
No, very, very pertinent for sure. Uh, I want to dig deeper on where you were just then with some of the disclosures. And, you know, you've referenced uh, the re recent updates this week here in the U.S. Uh, so I think one question that's kind of a theme across a number of submissions as well is maybe some differences in the U.S. compared to other parts of the world, you know, where the EU is headed compared to where the U.S. is headed, uh, you know, who's ahead, who's behind, what, where is it more specific, where is it mandated versus where is it voluntary. Uh, there was one question specifically on if these are systemic level risks, then how important is firm specific disclosure? Uh, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more about how you see differences and how this is being approached in different parts of the world, uh, especially contrasting the U.S. versus other countries. Um, I should be diplomatic on this call, correct? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's fair to say Europe is leading the charge here. Uh, it's not the U.S. The U.S. is lagging behind in terms of disclosure and sustainable business practice more generally. Um, and I, I hope that was diplomatic enough. Um, <laughs> Um, it, there's a lot going on. So it's, there's so much going on, it's hard to keep track on. Actually, you know, policy discussions, there's a lot of discussion about uh, um, voluntary disclosure frameworks and standardization thereof. Um, I, I do think, you know, we are making progress, but are we making progress fast enough? <laughs> Um, that's that's one question. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so I would say Europe is probably leading the charge here. Asian countries are also speeding up their game. And it's really North America that is splendidly behind. Hmm. Um, I, I, it's, it's such a big topic. I don't even know where to start. Sure. <laughs> so can I add, do I have the speaker? So please refer to the December speech by uh, Petro Meadows on um, mm -hmm. greenwashing. There is a cross-country comparison. Ah, yes, a throwback. Uh, so several of you asked questions about whether the video materials are available. Uh, so actually on the ICG website, uh, there's access to all the past lectures. So uh, June is reminding us that in December, uh, we actually had a country-specific analysis that some of you may wish to refer to. Uh, changing gears just a little bit. So I did think it was very intriguing in your presentation, the first part of your presentation, Caroline, to think about some of the compensation elements that you've studied in the past, tying uh, incentives. Uh, in general, there was a little bit of a thread of some of the pre-presentation questions around how much focus goes towards E and to S of ESG, and a little bit of curiosity about what else do you see moving forward in terms of what we should know about uh, the G, the governance. So I think you address some of that, uh, especially in the second half of your presentation. Uh, but what else would you say about the latest developments in regard to governance and structures within organizations? How else would you encouraging, uh, to the extent that we have practitioners and board members on this call, how should they be thinking about their responsibilities and how those have changed in the current environment around ESG? Uh, can you talk a little bit more specifically about governance? Um. Hmm. Um, so, where do I start? Maybe one, so if you think about governance and what has been done with respect to E and S, okay, now I'm flipping back to E and S, um, uh, something that probably there is potential for improvement mm -hmm. is, so let's take the example of diversity and inclusion, how to improve the governance with respect to that, correct? A lot of attention has been on quotas, but is quotas really the relevant metric? Is it really sufficient? Um, in a sense of quotas might give you a seat at a table or diversity gives a seat at a table, but this, does it give you a voice? And I think the, the relevant question is, how can you provide a voice to underrepresented groups, to underserved communities, to X, Y, Z, and hereby help improve the governance of the company? Um, and I guess what I'm pointing towards is a move from, from thinking about certain thresholds and more moving towards processes. Um, again, think about the bigger picture about we, fa we face broader societal environmental challenges. And as long as we don't address them, they might not be financial material in the short term at this moment, but if we don't address them, 
over time, they become systemic risks and likely influence, um, uh, become financial material in the long term. So kind of this dynamic materiality. Um, and so to not only think about the, the alpha in the short term all the time, but also how can we mitigate, help mitigate systemic risks and what kind of processes would we need to put in place in order to decrease these overall systemic risks? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so really moving, moving, moving beyond just again just the firm level and thinking broader about if we don't take actions, and as long as governments don't take sufficient actions down the road, how would this influence our companies? financial performance um, and risk exposure. Mm -hmm. it might be still too vague. I'm not sure you're satisfied with my answer here. Um, Zach, could you give me my voice? It's there. All right. Uh, this is related to the early discussions, actually the uh, inaugural speech by Alex Edman. And Alex had a long debate, a serious debate with uh, Professor Lucia Bavchuk at uh, Harvard Law School. So that's the shareholders where the stakeholders uh, goes. Because usually in the corporate governance uh, area, we talk about stakeholder, we usually talk about shareholders uh, interest, shareholders value. But if you really want to maximize, as Carolyn pointed out multiple times, long-term value of shareholders, then you probably have to incorporate the broader scope of the stakeholders, including your communities, including your employees, including the environment, climate risk, biodiversity. So this is all interrelated, even though the traditional governance topics are more shareholder centered rather than stakeholder centered. So maybe we should revisit this topic sometime in the future, lectures to how to wrap up the entire discussion back to the area we're very familiar with, which is corporate governance centered on shareholders' interest, short-term versus long-term, and to what extent that's related to the current discussion on environmental and social-related issues. Matt? Uh, yeah, absolutely, and thank you, June. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. Quite very often in our discussions, be it corporate governance or be it you know, strategy, et cetera, we very often really just focus on the short-term. But if you lengthen that time horizon, does it change anything? And also, could you know, being aware of all the assumptions we are making that, oh, the government is going to play its role and implement relevant policies. Well, what if it doesn't? How, as long as we don't address climate change, as long as we don't address biodiversity loss, and many folks, for example, don't realize that in order to mitigate climate change, there's no way around it, we need to deal with the biodiversity crisis um, as biodiversity in nature provides a natural carbon sink, correct? If we don't address this, this likely leads to you know, issues of food security, forced migration, political tensions, um, geopolitical issues, et cetera, et cetera. So how do these issues, so again, if we don't take actions, we as a collective, this includes governments, companies, investors, et cetera, those, those grants as our terms are not going away. And this likely has financial implications and risk implications for the company. So I, I think it's both ways. One is taking a longer term view, but also taking a broader view um, and, and making sure we are aware of the strong assumptions we've been making in the past. I'm just I'm just rephrasing what you just said, John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, as we get near the end of this, Caroline, may I step back and just ask you an introspective question about your own work? Obviously, some of these are themes you've been studying for over a decade now. Uh, could you just comment on how your own research interests have changed over time, and maybe give us a little bit of a preview about the the aspects of this systematic systemic level view uh, that you think you're most likely to be delving into next? And I'll add one addendum to that. So obviously much of your career, you were affiliated with business schools. Now you also are affiliated with the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, does that reveal something about the shift in your interest and your thoughts on, on how to address some of these large concerns? Oof, um, how many minutes do I have? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
thank you for making me feel old just now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, decades of people doing research on this topic. No, more seriously. Um, you know, it, it was also, I mean, most of my research, my own research is also focused on the front level, correct? So this, this has also been a, a kind of a, an insight I gained over time. Much of my research is also whether or not a company benefits from doing in, engaging environment social practices. And only re later I realized, wait a minute, if those practices are on average beneficial to a company, why don't companies do it? And so pretty much basically the way I present it is kind of also the path of my own thinking, like it has evolved, correct? And then realizing maybe we need to address, um, um, ask new questions in corporate governance, like how can we align the incentives of managers with, with the company's uh, best interest? But then also moving beyond the company, how do we actually address these bigger societal challenges? And what are the limitations? Again, this is not all win-win by no means. But I think, um, you know, then that leads then also to partnerships. So if it doesn't make sense for, for example, private investors to finance certain things, could there be a way by partnering, by blending capital together with development finance institutions and philanthropies, et cetera, uh, so this development funding that subsidizes and de-risks private capital investments, could this be a way how we then can close this financing gap? So um, that, of, that immediately leads to public-private partnerships, correct? Um, and might also lead me more into kind of these School of International Public Affairs uh, mm -hmm. kind of areas. But I, th I think there's really a, a huge opportunity and need to move beyond just the, the walls of a business school, mm -hmm. it, both you know, research-wise, but also um, the, the research questions we are asking, but also really thinking about how can we, how can for-profit companies and you know, private capital investors partner with others? Um, it's not either or. I think in corporate governance, also this whole stakeholder versus shareholder debate, very often it's the question is kind of whose responsibility is it as opposed to it's everyone's responsibility and what can each one of us do mm -hmm. to, to actually address the challenges we are facing in the real world. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, I do want to acknowledge uh, that there are dozens of questions that have come in. Uh, some of them were specific to where you were in your presentation on particular studies, uh, just to give a sampling of the themes, you know, there's a lot of follow-up questions about the drivers of voting on specific shareholder proposals and the role of activists in some of those campaigns. Uh, there's more questions about the SEC disclosure of those firm versus industry specific risks. Uh, there's questions about the specific sectors that you were referencing, you know, asking whether a lot of your findings are driven by tech companies, which often rate very highly on a number of these dimensions, uh, and the engagement of uh, the mining sector, for instance. Uh, there was a number of follow-up questions about the incentives and relationships with long-term performance, uh, questions about the responsibilities of companies and countries for historic emissions, uh, the legal frameworks we could expect going forward, the role of politicization that you mentioned a couple times yourself. Uh, so I just wanted to go ahead and acknowledge there's well over 100 participants on the call. They've submitted dozens of questions. They're obviously very engaged uh, with the work you presented. And while we don't have time to get to each of those specific questions, I did want to be able to highlight the themes of what people are asking and engaging with. Uh, so with that, I want to hand it uh, back to June to close us up. Caroline, thank you so much uh, for providing uh, this systemic level view. And I hope uh, that it's useful in inspiring uh, subsequent research by quite a number of the people on the call today. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, you much. so much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, Carolyn. That's uh, Carolyn's uh, concluding remark reminds me of the UNPRI -PR, uh, in-person conference. There, there are more than 1,300 SI owners, SI investors, and uh, leading academics uh, talking about climate change, uh, uh, biodiversity risks. So this, uh, this is not only uh, finance management or business scholars, but also scientists really studying uh, climate risk and uh, biodiversity. So I think that's the collaboration we need to keep seek, uh, seeking and Caroline is leading us in that direction. And in the process of modifying our slides, we admitted two important awards that Caroline won in recent years, Moscovich Award, uh, both for her research on socially responsible uh, 
investing. So once in 2013, another in 2017. So all the questions that Carolyn wasn't able to address will be read, read, uh, written up, posted on our uh, blog. So that's the Kelly ICD blog. I will be writing in about a week and on the slide second time, uh, last time, this is the next public lecture by Kelly Shu from Yale University Incentives and Promotions. With that, thank you so much to your attendance. Thank you for staying up late if you're in the Asian area and I hope to see you next time. Thank you and bye.